Good morning. Welcome to Coffee Talk. Today's topic is reflective writing. Joining us is Professor Barbara Novak from our English department in the School of Arts and Sciences. And Barbara is going to share with us how we can do some reflective writing during this period of time when we're home. I welcome Barbara. She's on audio only. So I thank her for joining us and I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say. It's a matter of um, finding mindful moments and that is really a matter of focusing. All you, have, you, you just can focus on the smallest thing, um, making yourself your cup of coffee. As you're doing it, you focus on what you're doing and that clears your mind actually. It separates you from whatever is going on in your everyday. I do it by looking out my kitchen window at my backyard. Um, and I focus on right now, I'm looking at the way the wind is blowing my lilac bush, the way the wind is blowing the leaves on the tree. Um, and okay, you get into this reflective mode. And then, um, then the question is, what do you do with, the re with what you're observing? How, uh, how do you reveal the quality of the experience? Um, Sherlock Holmes famously said, you see, but you don't observe. So seeing is different from observing. Um, when you observe, you ask yourself, why am I looking at it? And then you ask yourself, what am I seeing? And then you ask yourself, how do I feel about it? So looking, um, observing means your vision pauses on something. Um, so it means you are pausing, you are noticing something, you are noticing aspects of it, and you are allowing what you're observing to resonate with you. And then you take the next step, which is you ponder how it's resonating with you. Not only what it means to you, but how that meaning is experienced. Like my poem, the one I sent out, I ended with um, grace and gratitude. Those two words um, w reflected how the experience was resonating with me. So you think, how can I describe this? Um, and how can I characterize it? How can I maybe compare it to something, <laughs> excuse me, something else, an analogy? That if you have an analogy, that's a comparison to something else, and that gives your observation some resonance because what you're doing with an analogy is you're taking two things that are on the surface unlike each other, but you're finding common qualities. Like you might say, as I did in the poem Montauk that I sent out early in uh, September, I compared the moon to a pearl on black velvet. Um, okay, well, the moon is the moon. It's looking white in the night sky. But to compare it to a pearl on black velvet, you're giving it that extra resonance of a gemstone on the jeweler's tray of black velvet. So you're enriching the description. So um, th those are some ways that you can find the words to express the experience and give it the uh, give it the depth that you are personally experiencing. So it's be mindful, be aware, be observant, and you have to be specific. See, words finding the words is a very interesting aspect of this because words in themselves are very specific, but words characterize, words define, words um, provide boundaries. Like I keep a journal when I'm going through, primarily when I'm going through difficult times, because sometimes your moods can be amorphous, they can be like just a, a dark cloud, but if you find the words to express them, um, it gives those dark, that darkness boundaries. Um, and, um, uh, also another aspect of this in, in terms of finding the words is our realities are subjective. How we perceive the world is subjective. So finding the words helps convey 
the meaning of whatever you're observing, whatever you're experiencing, the meaning of it to you personally. Um, again, the grace and gratitude in my poem was my personal subjective um, interpretation. Um, and also, it's very interesting. I just heard on the radio the other day that uh, Massachusetts General Hospital now has a writer in residence mm -hmm. to encourage reflection um, uh, in terms of what the uh, the uh, you know first responders, health healthcare providers are experiencing. So, I mean, I, these are just some um, aspects of reflective writing. Does anybody have any questions? So, Barbara, I um. I, you know, I would never, you know, consider myself to ever to, to be a quote unquote poet or, or put something in poetry. When you start reflective writing um, and you really, it's just kind of the, the journaling aspect, do you, mm -hmm. do poems come from what you pull out of there or do you actually, do you yourself actually write in prose? Oh, I, I mean, I write prose as well as poetry. Um, most of my uh, reflective writing just happens to be poetry. When I have kept journals, when I've gone through times when I've been depressed, you know, just with situational things, that's all prose. That's just me spewing. <laughs> but um, no, most of the reflective writing is, is, is poetry. That That's what comes to me. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't come in its final form. It um, maybe an image will come to me, uh, maybe like from right now, I'm watching the wind blowing the leaves on my lilac bush. So I might just write the wind is blowing the leaves on my lilac bush, a wind, wind uh, blowing lilac leaves or something. And then I'll see where it takes me. I just follow follow the initial image, follow the initial words. And really it's, it's allowing yourself to follow your thoughts really, not jumping in edit, editing yourself, but you, editing comes in later um, you, when you, you know, refine it, but you have to allow yourself just, oh, I'm seeing something, I'm observing something, just, write what you're seeing, write what you're feeling about it. And um, however it comes out, allow it to, um, to exist. And then if you want to polish it or refine it, that's up to you. But you have to let the words flow to uh, have your thoughts exist um, in, in words. Does that help? That does, that does help. Yeah, I think, I think a problem a lot of people have is editing themselves before they do anything, you know, prejudging themselves. You have to give yourself permission to just follow your thoughts, write the words, you know, and if, if you don't have the perfect word, just leave a space, scribble in something underneath. I, I, I'm saying I write longhand, you know, uh, you know, if I'm doing something on, on a computer, I will just uh, leave a space and in bold, just type in some word that's close to the word I want and keep going. Don't stop. Don't stop the flow. Just look, just let it all come out and then go back and see what you put down. Exactly. I think, you know, a big problem a lot of people have is, is stopping themselves, stopping the flow. You have to let the words come out. That's the writer part of you. The editor part of any writing experience, the editor part of you comes in much later. You have to let the writer part of you write. That's great. Does anybody have any questions for Barbara? Uh, or anything they'd like to share about things that they have written or the way that they approach their own writing? Everybody right now is on silent. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've got everybody on mute, but the uh, but I but you can unmute yourself if you'd like to. But the um, it uh, for purposes of uh, those that look at their editing, can you talk a little bit about um, when prose? Everybody thinks that a poem needs to rhyme. You know. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, there, there is rhyme poetry, of course, but I work mostly in free verse. Free verse is, um, it's unrhymed. It doesn't have a set uh, meter, 
but there is always the attention to the musicality of the words, how the sounds go together, how the rhythms go together. Um, uh, so there is attention to that, and you can, um, you know, use use words that rhyme internally. It's always, you know, um, something that you, it's always a good idea to end a poem with something that resonates with the reader. It's what I came I call a ping, P-I-N-G ending. You know, when you flick your nail against crystal, it pings. That means it's resonating. So you always try to end anything you're writing with a ping ending, something that will resonate with the reader. Stay with them after they finish reading the poem or the story or the book or whatever it is you're writing. Um, and sometimes that could be a couple of lines that, that rhyme, you know, or uh, some rhymes at the end because that catches the reader's attention. But no, poetry does not have to rhyme, but you really should be uh, pay attention to how those sounds go together and how the words go together. And to do that, just say it out loud so you can hear it. That is great advice, I love that. And then the last question I have for you before we have to wrap up is when it comes to titling your work, does, oh. does that kind of just flow from what you've written or do you, oh. have you ever start out with a, something, oh, I want to work on this title and I'm going to find words to go with it? Oh, the titles can be the hardest thing. I <laughs> could have the poem written and then you ponder the title and um, go this way, go that way. Um, titles are sometimes harder to write than the poem. <laughs> no, seriously, because you want a title that conveys something but doesn't give the entire poem away, that lets the reader know sort of what it's about, um, you know, but it, it, I sometimes play, sometimes the titles come, but sometimes I play with titles for a very, very long time. T titles, as I say, can be harder to write than the poem. That's, that's, <laughs> that's why I think some poems. would... What's that? That's what I imagine because you want the first thing somebody sees is the title, and that either exactly. leads them into the poem or it's like, oh no, it's not something I'm interested in. Exactly, exactly. It's like um, the first page of a novel. If it doesn't grab you right away, you're not going to read on. And editors, if you if they see a manuscript, uh, if the first page doesn't grab them. They won't bother reading the rest. I mean, you could say, well, it really picks up in chapter five, but they're not going to read that far. So you want to really, yes, the title is very important, but uh, it's, 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 a, it's difficult to come up with just the right thing very often. Well, Barbara, I thank you very much um, for sharing your expertise, your thoughts, uh, the idea of reflective writing, the idea for me, because I, I'm not, um, I, I'm not so much a reflective writer, but to know that I maybe I could take the time to sit at my dining room table and watch the trees sway uh, and see what comes. Yeah, I, 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 but I, I'm glad you said that because you don't have to feel that you are a writer I, to do this. And I think it's really beneficial for everyone to just sit and observe and even just jot down what you're seeing. Take that moment. Thank you, Barbara. That's wonderful. And, and I also love the descriptor of the ping ending. So I thank you oh, for that. Thank you much. so much. So I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody for Thursday. Um, and, and we are all going to think about our ping endings when we're writing. And I thank Barbara Novak, our writer in residence, for jumping on with us today. It was really terrific. You guys all Thank you care. so very much. And I'll see you tomorrow for TGIF. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, bye, Barbara. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Barbara. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Thank Barbara. Thank you.